Hi, welcome to Elasticity. Today we are going to talk about index notation and it's a tutorial on how to do some basic things about index notation. So let's get started. So first item, what the heck is index notation? That's simple. See, when we do a lot of stuff in continuum mechanics and mathematics and so on, what we have to do is a lot of matrix operations, not just with square matrices, but with higher order matrices, things which have not only row, column, but has row, column, height and something else, you know, all kinds of things, not just two dimensional, three dimensional, four dimensional, five dimensional matrices and so on. So it gets very cumbersome to be able to write all the terms or to be able to use just simple matrix notation. So that's why we try to use something that's more complicated. So the next question you might have is, why, why the heck should I learn it? It will turn out that it will enable you to make a lot of calculations quite easily. I can tell you from my own personal experience that knowing index notation has helped me do some very complicated calculations in a very straightforward way. Okay, so it's well worth putting the effort. The bang for the buck is good. Okay, um, and one of the nice things is if you can write equations in index notation, it's actually pretty easy for you to program them. I mean, that's a pretty useful thing, right? So that's why I want you to learn something about index notation. And well, what should you know before you start learning something about index notation? You should know about two things. One is matrix algebra. So you should know how to do matrix multiplication, you know, what is meant by uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, that kind of stuff, and vector calculus, at least in Cartesian coordinates. So you should be familiar with divergence, gradient, curl, all of these things, uh, gradient of a vector and so on, all of these things in Cartesian coordinates because it will help you. If you know those these two things, then matrix, then this index notation will benefit you quite a bit. Okay, so let's just get started. So we have a Euclidean space, n dimensional. So there's nothing which says it has to be three dimension. Typically in elasticity, we will work in either two, three, six dimensions. That's very typical. Two, three, or six dimensions. I'll tell you why you work in six dimensions when we get to that space. Okay. And in an n-dimensional Euclidean space, you can talk about an orthonormal basis. Orthonormal means basis vectors are perpendicular to, to each other and unit length. So remember that, that's what we mean by orthonormal. And that means that every vector can be written in terms of the orthonormal basis. For example, we are used to writing v equal to v1i plus v2j plus v3k, that kind of thing. Instead, we can write it as VIEI summation. Okay, so the nice thing about, about writing things in orthonormal basis is that I can write a vector V either as a column vector. You remember our notation. Uh, if you if you went through our vector calculus uh, notes, then you remember that our notation for a column vector is square brackets and our notation for a row vector is angle brackets. Looks like this. So I can either write it like this or like that without worry about whether it's a column vector or a row vector. That's the nice thing about orthonormal basis. Okay, and we don't want to go on writing all three. Okay, instead I just want to write it as VI. VI means either V1, V2, V3 or V1, V2, V3. Either a row vector or a column vector. I tells you which element and the value for i may go from 1, 2, 3 or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 or whatever we like. Okay. So that's how it works. Excellent. So they're saying, okay, what's the big deal? So our first step is the following. All our vector and matrix operations involve either sums or products. So it looks like a times b, c times d, c times c, some, something, but it's always sums or products, some combination of sums and products. There will never be division. In vector, in vector algebra. There is only addition, subtraction, multiplication. So this is what we are going to use. And the idea is we are going to introduce two things. One is called a term. So any independent variable, these things are called terms. So when I refer to a term, I mean variable. Okay. And then a product is a grouping of terms. So that's a product. That's a product. 
that's a product and that's a product okay so terms products very good so now the idea is products are separated either by plus signs minus signs whatever or uh, equality or inequality signs okay or it could be less than or equal to greater than or equal to something like that okay very good so now we are going to talk about index notation and its rules rule number 1 says no product or term can an sorry a product or term a product or term can have an index that appears twice but not more than twice up to twice is allowed but not more than twice what i mean by that you will see in a second so for example let's say i write don't worry about what it means at this stage let's say i write an equation like this or a or a set of terms or expressions like this okay now look here this is a product right this piece notice in this product j appears twice i appears once that's allowed you can have j appearing twice i appearing once but j cannot appear three times here what happens is you can see j appears three times that's not allowed here you can see that j appears four times not allowed here you can see that i appears once k appears twice that's okay look at this one here j appears twice k appears twice i appears once so the number of appearances in a product has to be less than or equal to 2 that's our rule number 1 that's an important rule number of appearances of a product has to be less than or equal to 2 okay the second rule is that if a term appear if a index appears once in a product it has to appear in every product in that equation and it has to appear exactly once in that every product in that equation what do i mean by that look at this one so j appears once in this product correct that means in this case j has to appear once now remember that's our rule now let's look here here j appears once j appears once j appears once that's all okay but it has to appear in every product once things that appear twice that's no problem k appears twice here but k does not appear here and that's okay product things that appears twice in a term these things they don't have to appear in every case that's why those things that appear twice and they are called dummy indices okay and they don't have to appear in every product but things that appear once has to appear in every product things cannot appear more than twice so that's a very simple rule right once means it has to appear the same index has to appear every time twice means that they don't have to appear in in any of the other indices i mean in, in any of the other products it's okay it cannot appear more than twice that's our rule now if you look here this looks to be okay no i and i j and j but remember it has to be index it cannot be a term so here i is an index but here i is a term so remember this cannot happen because i appears once here it does not appear here so this is not possible if you look here i got a mess here i appears once j appears once i is okay but j is not okay look i appears once k appears once but k is not anywhere else j and k these kinds of things are not allowed if in any one term i and k appears it has to appear everywhere so checking these things these are called free indices so let me write it down index appears once and that's called a free index index appears twice 
and that's called a dummy index. So that's the idea, okay? Free index and dummy index. Okay, now we come to the most important idea, which is summation convention. What it is is that whenever you do matrix operations, you are always writing summation. For example, when I do A times B, this is summation over all the call, all the row, it is row times column, right? When I do A times B, matrix multiplication, like that, all over the place we are going on doing summation. So we are going to have a fixed convention which says that whenever a index appears twice, we are going to automatically assume that it actually showed up like a summation. So look at this equation. The i, the free index tells you which equation. The summation is over the index j. That means, that notice, it means put i equal to 1, i equal to 2, i equal to 3. So this tells you that there are three equations and each equation has a summation j equal to 1 to 3. So instead of writing these three equations with all these summations, this whole thing will be written like this. This is where we gain really with this index notation. This was invented. This idea of a summation convention is called the Einstein summation convention and it was invented for elegance of notation. So instead of writing these three things, so the minute I see that, when I see vi equal to aij vj, I know that this is the same as vi equals summation over j of aij vj. So the summation is implied. Let's see some examples and this is our rule. Any index that appears twice is sum. So look at here, I have aij, ai times bij equals cj. Well first let's see if our first two rules are applied. i appears twice, that's okay. J appears once here and of course I fixed it so J appears once there. That's okay. Now I have J appears once. The I summation is here. This is what it means. Now we got a much more complicated thing. So I have AIJ BIJ plus CIK BK. So it has CJK. Then this will be summation over I AI BIJ. Notice J is the free index. The free index shows up in every product. It does not have to show up in every term, but it has to show up in every product. Right? And notice that all the dummy indices, the things that appear twice, they are independently summed. This is sum over i, this is sum over k, this is sum over m and k. So notice this is a double summation. So instead of writing this, I am writing it just like this, with dropping the summation. So if I do that, that's called an index notation. Okay. So the dummy index rule says that if you if you sit if you come up with a situation in which you have to write an index four times, you can replace the dummy index with anything you want. Instead of summing over k, you can sum it over p or whatever you like. What I mean by that is, um, by the way, we, we looked at rule number five already. So for example. Look at this dummy index. This actually means a i j b x j summation over j, right? It doesn't really matter whether I write it as summation over j or summation over p. That's the same thing, no? Because we are writing is a i 1 x 1 plus a i 2 x 2 plus a i 3 x 3 plus a i 4 x 4 plus so on so forth, right? So if, if whether I call it P or J is irrelevant because the summation takes care of it. So this is the same as that. Notice here also, notice I didn't change the J in everything. I can change this. I can leave this independent. That's okay. Because this is actually two summations. And sometimes I may want to do this. Sometimes I may not want to do. So idea is, the dummy index, as the name implies, is a dummy. So you can change it any to anything you want.
to make sure that you don't have more than twice. So the dummy index has to appear exactly twice. The free index has to appear exactly once in every product. Okay. Now see here what happened? You wanted to change the J to I, right? Now what happened is unfortunately now you have three I's and that's not allowed. So you might have you should have written this as A I J X J equal to A I P X P. These are the rules. So remember, let's quickly go through all the rules so that we know what we are talking about. So first one is that a product or a term can have an index appear twice but not more than twice. It can appear once, it can appear twice but more than more than twice. If it appears once, it's called a free index. It has to appear in every product. If it appears twice, it cannot appear more than twice in any product but you don't have to worry about whether it appears in other products or not. The next thing is summation con convention tells us that if a index appears twice, summation is implied. So that takes a little bit getting used to and then the third rule, the dummy index rule is the clever rule and this takes some getting used to which says that if an index, in, you can change the dummy index to any other thing you want as long as you don't violate rules 1 and 2. Okay. Ah, so we already talked about the free index rules. I am telling you this again because this is important. So an index that appears only once in a product is called a free index and it must it tells you how many equations are there and must appear on both sides of a relation and must appear in each product. So for example, in this particular case, I appears on both sides of the relation exactly once. That's okay. Notice here, I appears here but not here. That's no use. Look here, I appears here and here but not here. So that's not allowed. Okay. So any index that appears only once in one product has to make its appearance in every product. By the way, now comes the most important thing. You don't have to worry about the order of the terms. The terms are scalars. The index tells you where they are in the matrix. So don't mess with the indices. So if you look at this equation, what is it telling? It's telling take the third term from the vector A and multiply it with the third column, for example, of the matrix C. As long as you keep those two things, the order in which you multiply the terms don't matter, but don't mess with the indices. The terms can be swapped, indices cannot be swapped. Okay, In a product, you can write the terms in any way you like, don't mess with the index. Because it tells you where it is in the matrix. So if you change the index, you are looking at a different term in the matrix. So remember that. Okay. Now we come to the core idea. If you look at this, this is A times C. Matrix C. How did I know that? It tells you that it takes the <coughs> the ith row of C and multiplies it with A. So, if I write like that, Cij is ith row jth column. Correct? So, if I look at the ith row, it is here. And I am going to multiply it with A. So, Sorry, um, I'm going to multiply it with the row vector like this. So I take this, multiply it like that. And so that's why it looks like A transpose C. So I want you to remember that. This one is C times A. Okay. I throw J column times J column, I column. I mean, sorry, J throw I column times I column. That's all it is. So, if you write it down, it is C. So, let us put J equal to 1. Remember summation over I. So, it is C11A1 plus C12A2 
plus C, 1, 3, A, 3, plus. You can see it's multiplying the first row of C with the first column of A. If you write this one, if you put J equal to 1, it will be A1, C12, plus A2, sorry, C11, plus A2, C21, plus A3, C31. Can you see that? It's taking the row of A and multiplying along the column of C. And in this particular case, it's multiplying along the first column of C. Okay, so remember that. So it will do matrix multiplication in a very nice way. So if you want to mark around with a free index, you can change it if you change it in every term. So look at this one. Can you see free index is that CI, CI, CI. You can change I to P, but you have to change it to P and P there. You don't have to do the same thing with the J. So for example, I can rewrite it as AI equals CIPXP plus DIJKFJK. Hey, did I not violate the rule that I just spoke out? But remember, this is a dummy index. Appears twice. I can do what the heck I want with it. As long as I don't violate the first two rules. I can change it in indiv indiv individual products. So whole another thing to muck around with the free index. The free index is the thing that connects across the products. Okay. So if you muck around with the free index, you are, you are mixing up things very badly. If you muck around with a dummy index, you are just changing how you are doing the summation. That's not a big deal. But if you muck around with the free index, you are messing with all the terms. So make sure that free indices, if you want to change, change it in each of them independently, nicely. And last thing, please, there is no division by index quantities because division by indivi individual components of a vector are, are not allowed. Okay, that has no meaning. So you cannot do these kinds of things. If I write this, now you cannot do this. This is not correct. Okay, so please remember, we cannot write it. Even if it works out correctly, you are not allowed to write it because there is no way to implement these kinds of things. Okay, so don't divide by index quantities because that's like dividing by a vector and I hope you know that that's a no-no. Okay, and then there are two special terms. One is called a Kronecker delta, which is delta ij and I'm sure you've heard of this, which is 1 if i equal to j equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. So this is like an identity matrix. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Notice that this one, uh, delta 1, 1 is 0, delta 2, 2 is 1, sorry, delta 1, 1 is 1, delta 2, 2 is 1, delta 3, 3 is 1, but delta 1, 2 is 0, delta 1, 3 is 0. So, if i and j are not the same, you get 0. So, the Kronecker delta is the matrix representation of identity matrix. And it has very useful roles, but it's a matrix representation of identity matrix. The other one which is very very important is this thing which is called the permutation symbol and it's defined as epsilon i j k is one half i minus j times j minus k times k minus i which is equal to one if i and j and k are even permutations. So if you write one, two, three like this, if you go clockwise you will get one that is epsilon one, two, three is one, epsilon two, three, one is one, epsilon 3, 1, 2 is 1. You see what I mean? As long as you go clockwise. If you go epsilon 3, 2, 1, you are going counterclockwise, that will be minus 1. Epsilon um, 2, 3, 1, sorry, 2, 1, 3 equal to minus 1 and so on. The interesting thing is epsilon 3, 3, 1, all of these things are 0. If any two things are repeated, it's 0. It is the exact Opposite of this, you can see that now. This one will only be non-zero if they are repeated. Epsilon i j k will only be non-zero if they are not repeated. Okay, so that's how it works. These two things are very useful. The permutation symbol is very useful for doing cross products and things like that. So that's a very useful one. Okay, very good. So now let's look at some basic vector operations. A dot b. Vector A dot vector B is, you know, A dot B 
is a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus like that huh? that is sigma over i ai bi which turns out to be we will write it as ai bi or like this delta ij ai bj and that's a stupid way to write it but sometimes it's useful what it means is that it is if you summation over i summation over j you will see that whenever i is not equal to j there is no term there is only terms there is only products when i equal to j and you'll get back this the other one is cross product a cross b a cross b vector the ith component will be epsilon i j k a j b k that's a cross b okay that's how it works very good so these are two very useful things and then there is something which is called a tensor product b which is the same as a uh, column vector times b row vector if you do this you will get a matrix this will look like a1 b1 a1 b2 a1 b3 a2 b1 a2 b2 so on and so this you can write it nicely as ai bj this tells you which row which column so a1 b1 tells you its first row first column so on a2 b1 tells you second row all the terms in the second row so on so forth okay and then you can do triple product a dotted with b cross c this is called box product or scalar triple product that turns out to be very easy epsilon i j k a i b j c k and you will get a nice scalar triple product and that's actually take this and dot it with that and use this and you will get that okay so the permutation symbol has some very nice properties so we already saw that a cross b is this a cross b dot c is this if you have the columns of a vector a of a matrix a to b a1 a2 a3 so if you have a11 a1 a21 a31 this is i'm calling this a1 a12 sorry uh, a22 a32 this is a2 and then a13 a23 a33 this is column vector a3 then determinant of a is just the box product between these two things a dotted with a2 cross a3 and you can write this as epsilon ijk ai1 aj2 ak3 very nice and it turns out that if you permute this itself switch the orders determinant of a will change the determinant will change sign so you can actually show that epsilon pqr of determinant of a is this this so what happens is you can use this as a representation for determinant of a sometimes people will use this and it's a very convenient way of calculating determinant of calculating things about the determinant okay we talked about the delta notice delta ii is delta 11 plus delta 22 plus delta 33 that's equal to 1 and then what happens with the delta is it will change the index see this j index will go away because delta is 0 unless j equal to k so this will become ak and then delta ij delta jk is the same way you can get rid of the j and it will become delta ik so this is the properties of delta you are wondering why it's here because i'm going to fill the rest of the stuff with properties of epsilon so if you take two epsilons and multiply to them together notice that there is no common term this is a this is a six index thing it turns out that you can rewrite it in terms only of deltas and this is determinant of this delta matrix delta il delta im delta in delta jl delta jm delta jn delta kl delta km delta kn like that so and if you expand it you know how to expand the determinant right it is delta il times this times this minus this times that 
this, then minus delta, you know what I mean, right? So you can expand it, you'll get this huge mess. This is not particularly useful, but things that you can get out of it are very useful. For example, if I make L equal to I, that means I am writing summation over I of epsilon I J K epsilon I M N. That turns out to be very useful. It is delta J M delta K M minus delta J N delta K M. So that's easy. If you want to remember this, it is J M K N minus J N K M. See, it's if you now sum two of them, so slowly you are just saying m equal to j. So first thing we did was we put l equal to i. Then we put m equal to j. If you do that, you will just get twice delta k n. Epsilon i j k, epsilon i j n is two times delta k. That you can see very easily by putting m equal to j. So delta j j delta k n is 3 delta k n minus delta j n delta k j. So what happens is the j will become k. So 3 delta k n minus 2 delta k n is 2 delta k n. That's how you got it. Okay. Last thing, if you sum this, that means k equal to n and I'll get 2 times delta k k. That's 2 times 3 equal to 6. So I want you to understand, this is the sweet spot. Epsilon i j k, epsilon i m n. It's well worth memorizing this. Epsilon i j k, epsilon i m n will be equals. First do the inside ones. Delta j m, delta k n. Then do the outside one. Minus delta j n, delta k m. If you remember that, you will find that a yeah, lot of things come turn out to be very easy. Okay, very good. Last thing, let's look at some standard matrix operations. So, if you have a times b equal to i, it will look like this: a i j b j k equal to delta i k. This is identity matrix. This is row times column. Okay, this is the i row times the k column. Vector i row times the column vector will give you a times b. And as I told you, the order in which you write the terms don't matter. The order in which the indexes appear matter. So this always tells you this is the free index is the most important thing. The location of the free index is really important. That tells you which row you are doing. Right? So let's look at next one. This one is actually column times row. So this tells you it is the jth column which is multiplied with b. So in the previous case it was the ith row which was multiplied with b. In this case it is the jth column which is multiplied with b. So this is this kind of thing. If you want to multiply two matrices, you multiply the ith row with the kth column and you will get the ikth term. Make sense to you? So, notice, first index tells you which row, second index tells you which column, dummy tells you summation. That's how it works. Okay. If you want to do A, B transpose, what do you have to do? You have to multiply the ith row of A with the ith row of B. Notice, uh, sorry, kth row of B. So, ith row of A multiplied by kth row of B, the other index is summed over. Make sense to you? So, row times row looks like that. If you want to do three times, then ith row of A multiplied by the kth column of B of the result you have to take the next one and multiply. So this will give you 
I L E I L. Of course, I mean when I typed this up, I made some mistakes. I'm sorry about that, but you know um, that's what happens the first time you do it. Next time I do it, I'll fix this. Okay. Now let's learn something about manipulation of index quantities. Let us say I have phi equals a dot b, and then b equals k times t. If I want to write it as index notation, that's pretty easy, right? Phi equals a i b i, b s equal to k s r p r. Now I want to get rid of the b from these two equations. So what I want to do is I want to substitute for bi. What should I do for that? First, change the index of b to match because I have bi. This is bs, so I'm going to write it as bi equals kir pr. So this is kir pr. So now I can take that and plug it in here, and you will get ai kir pr, which is Notice I switched the dummy index and I could have switched this to anything I wanted. So this could be k j i a j p i. That's also okay. As long as the same two indices are summed over. The index the index notation, sorry, location is important. The index location is important. Okay, so please pay attention to that. I'll give you another example. Now you got A I equals B J C J I, B I equal to E I D I J. So now let us see. Oh, sorry. So I can substitute directly here, but if I do that, I will get simple substitution. Gives me A I equals B J. It's E J D J I C J I. This is very bad news. You can see that the dummy index is screwed up. I mean, the free index is screwed up. It has showed up three times. The dummy index is messed up because it has showed up three times. So this is all bad. So what do I do? Let us change the dummy index. I'm going to write this as B J equals. First, I'm going to change the dummy index here, and I'm going to write instead of writing. Um, sorry. Sorry about that, but okay. So if you look here, if I directly substitute, this is what I'll get. And notice that my dummy index has serious problems, and then I have some free-floating dummy indices and all kinds of other stuff. So what I would need to do is first go back here and change its dummy index so that you don't have a problem. So E I has become E P D P J. Now you go and substitute. Now you'll get A I is E P D P J C J I. So match dummy index of free indices in substitution. Replace dummy. Index. That's how you work. So you want to make sure you match the free index, but you can replace the dummy. Okay. If it turns out you make a mistake, you will see that you will violate some free index rule or some dummy index rule. Those are the two things that you have to really look at. What will happen is you will find an index appearing in a product more than three times, or an index that does not show up in one of the products. Either one, you have a problem. Okay. And just to get you going you can do the same thing with all our vector calculus stuff that's why the comma notation is useful so f comma i is f comma 1 f comma 2 f comma 3 
say divergence of v is v i comma i that is v one comma one plus v one two comma two plus v three comma three. If you remember, that's what divergence looks like. Cross product, as usual, you'll get is epsilon i j k v k comma j. Gradient of a vector will give you a matrix. This is the i th row j th column. So v i j is the v i comma j is the i j th entry in the matrix. You can do all kinds of things. Divergence of gradient of f is del squared. That is the Laplacian of f. So you take gradient of f, f comma i, substitute it in here, and you'll get f comma i i. This is d squared f d x i d x i summation over i. And you will see, you will get all the terms. So the idea is, with the index notation, you can do a lot of manipulations. I want you to learn the rules of the index notation. In class, we will do some manipulations to make sure we understand. Okay, with that.